Thank you for joining us for this episode. Today, we're joined by Dr. Brianna Rue, and we're going to be speaking about myopia management, ODs versus OMDs, comparisons and differences on the Myopia Podcast. Optometric Insights Media proudly presents the Myopia Podcast, where we give you the latest myopia research, clinical topics, and industry insights. Make sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all of our awesome myopia content. And now to our host, a massive myopia manager himself, Dr. David Kading. Thank you for joining us for the Myopia Podcast. We're uh, joined by Brianna Rue. She is a fantastic practitioner and is crushing it in our industry and helping so many doctors. And she also has this little passion called myopia. And uh, we're excited to be able to talk with her on the podcast. How are you today, my friend? I'm doing good. Excited to be here. Got my coffee coffee cup here. Taking oh, it up to that that David Kading uh, next level here. Yes, the Mug Club Monday. Yeah, <laughs> thank you for the reference. Good. Um, so tell us where you practice, and uh, you have a little a little side gig that spends uh, a, an hour or two of your week that you do as well. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and uh, who you are? Yeah, so I practice in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale, graduated 2009, did my residency at Bascom, actually married a neuro-ophthalmologist, so that's always nice to have in my back pocket. Uh, I have two boys, one now just turning six, so I'm starting first grade. I hope that I remember my sight words, and an eight-month-old baby, um, so that takes most of my time. And then I also have my side hustle, now turned main hustle, which is Dr. Contact Lens. So again, we're putting the doctor's back in control of their practices so they can do what we do best, take care of their patients so others aren't doing that for them. Yes. And uh, we did another podcast on the OI show with you and talked about Dr. Contact Lens and uh, we're, we've are we implemented it into our practice. It's a, it's a fantastic thing. So tell us about your myopia passion. That's something that you do in practice. You're a scleral lens fitter. You do contact lens stuff. So tell us about myopia and what you're doing in that space. So myopia, I always, you know, we always talk about find your niche, find your niche, find your niche, right? And it mm-hmm. took me a long time to find my niche. I don't know about you, but you know, that burn and turn one or two. Now I think to, I count to eight pretty good because um, <laughs> it was getting exhausting. And so when I was pregnant with my first son, I just did a Google search and I said, you know, being a high myope myself, getting contact Mm. lenses in third grade. I'm a minus five and a half. My husband's a minus six and a half and becoming presbyopic. So if anybody wants a good patient, I got one for you. Um, (laughs) So what I did was, is there anything I can do to prevent this or slow this down and realize we're decades behind other parts of the world as far as treating this and implementing strategies. And that was in, you know, 2016 and went to vision by design, which is coming up and drank that Kool-Aid and went down this rabbit hole and never came back out. And it's, it changed my passion for vision and what is in our hands as optometrists on what we get to do every day and, and really help people and help these little patients where they don't end up like me. And so that's what brought me to myopia. Yeah. 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 So you, uh, you have been involved in the launch of, uh, of some new things in the myopia space. You were just sharing with me before we started about a meeting that you had combining ODs and MDs. And, you know, historically in the United States, uh, ophthalmology has been more progressive in myopia management with regards to atropine and uh, optometry has not really embraced atropine until just recently and vice versa in the orthokeratology world where we embraced it far earlier and they have been coming on board a little bit more recently. So tell us in this conversation that you had with ODs and MDs, some of the things that you took away. So I'll start by kind of prefacing it this way that I think sometimes we forget that it's a whole visual system, right? And we're part of this whole healthcare system for the patient Mm -hmm. from the, you know, the tear film to the cornea, to the lens, to the retina, to the brain, right? And so if you think of everybody that's in charge of that care of that vision from when the patient is born to going on to having LASIK to then 
developing a PSC and needing cataract surgery earlier to then potentially having a retinal, something like myopic maculopathy or a detachment to needing a glaucoma specialist, right? Think of that whole visual pathway that we're affecting. And so that's where really, I think this ODMD community comes together. Yeah. We're seeing that, right? And retinal detachments and myopic maculopathy are on the rise. Early cataract surgeries are on the rise. And so we've really got to get back to being patient centric. And that means all of us in that visual pathway work together. Yeah. Yeah. A a big part of that though, is I think that, um, that all of us in this healthcare arena have been very reactive rather than progressive and realizing that we're going to treat the retinal detachment. And, uh, now I think we're, we're really hitting the stride. And I think that's where myopia management is catching a wave and you and I, it's just normal, right? We want to keep people from becoming minus three, four, five, six, sevens to reduce the risk of retinal detachments. But our profession tends to be treat the retinal detachment and the patient with them. And so that can be the case for retinal surgeons who are just talking about fixing the the problem right then, right? But I think we're getting this wave of people who are coming in and seeing the importance of being proactive. Yeah. And one of the conversations that I had was with one of the retinal specialists and he goes, I treat this all day and not once have I ever thought of it from this way. So he was really Mm. brand new to myopia. And I even asked him, I posed the question. I said, where would this kind of come up in conversation, right? It's not going to be that 50 year old presenting with a life threatening complication with myopic maculopathy or RD, right? It's not going to be that initial visit. It's Mm. going to be on a follow-up asking about their kids, right? And just starting to interject these little seeds on that. And he goes, I am going to go back and now practice differently from just this one little conversation. And we'll get into it, you know, with the safety and efficacy of contact lenses in kids here later, but, and also atropine, they're adopting that model because not only have the American Academy of Ophthalmology said that this is it, but also not understanding that contact lenses are safe in kids. So it actually kind of broke out into a little battle last night that I had to kind of reel the crowd back in and say, guys, microbial keratitis, right? 12 and per 10,000, right? It's very, very little, even less in little kids because we're managing something mm-hmm. um, and, ma- and, you know, not just giving a contact lens prescription that they can get online. We're managing a disease. So it's a little different. And so it was, had to reel it back in that they went down that path that it's not safe. I'm not like one even said, you know, I don't feel comfortable in anybody under 13. And I was like, I w- I got contacts in third grade. It changed my life because mm-hmm. I was a gymnast and a dancer. You've got to mm-hmm. give these opportunities to those patients. And seeing that side of it where it was like, it's not safe, but we would rather them potentially have an adverse event on the cornea that we can fix versus myopic maculopathy that we can't. So it's balancing that act of risk versus reward. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we don't uh, keep our kids from going on bicycles. We know they're going to crash. We don't keep kids from getting in cars. We know there's going to be accidents that are happening. We just set the stage. We get them in their car seats, right? We put a helmet on them. We do everything we can to protect them, but we still have to have them doing the things that need to be done. We got to get them in the car to go to school. We need to be putting lenses on their eyes to slow the progression. That's a really interesting conversation about why risk this infection to slow the progression. Yeah. yeah. How did that, yeah, how did that conversation kind of kind of come about? Did did people see the other side of that? Eventually we got it, right? I had to like really reel the crowd back in cuz we kind of again it, the ODMD battle that's there consciously, right? It's always been a turf battle and it in this myopia space it doesn't have to be, right? Because they essentially need to be doing surgery. We're the ones taking time to educate the patients, right? So there's definitely everybody in this space needs to own that patient um, for the betterment of the patient. So how it kind of got back on track was one doctor was like, you know, the DK of this lens versus a DK of this one. And I'm like, DK, when was the last time we fit something based on 
DK, right? Monthly versus daily. Like, wow. Like it kind of got derailed there. And again, I had to bring it back as this is the visual system risk benefit. Somebody brought up, you know, you have more risk driving on 95, six mile stretch is the most dangerous stretch of road here in Miami. You have a more likely chance of that than this. Mm -hmm. So we brought it back to that pathology thing. And one thing I like to always say is that six-year-old that you and I see with the, the the board bling blurry, right? That you diagnose as a minus two today. 30 years from now, they're 36. 30 years from now, they're 66. That's two generations of doctors that are behind you and me. I don't want those doctors seeing what we're seeing in other parts of the world. It's not fair. And so wouldn't you rather know what you're changing on trajectory for your colleagues to come after you? That's what gets me excited about this is it's not here and now it's, it's that kid's life, the rest of their life, their Mm -hmm. vision, the rest of their life. And that's, I think where my passion comes from. Yeah. I hope they send me a cookie for seeing their patient and slowing the progression of the myopia and saving them from having, yeah. The, those doctors, the patient the, or the doctor, the, the, the doctors, right? You the know, cookie okay those is on its way, David. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, what were some of the other highlights that you uh, have taken away from this ophthalmology versus optometry perspective? Charging patient. Okay. So they went into, you know, they're very scared of, you know, they're very medical based, which is great. But feeling bad for charging patients for their services. I thought optometrists were bad, right? We don't, we're not taught how to charge for our services in school. We're saying, okay, go get do this OCT. It's just a learning program. We're never taught our value. And so I think with myopia management as optometrists, we've got to learn our value. With ophthalmologists too, some of them, yeah, are going to be business associated, but a lot of them are not. And they were saying, you know, well, my parent, my patients can't afford this. There's one doc here in South Miami inside of a Walmart that charges more than I do for myopia management and her stuff flies off the shelf. Mm -hmm. They come in, in their cars and with purses and with iPhones and whatever. It's again, making it valuable to the patient. They've got income to spend on this, right? And I'm, I'm sure maybe you can help me on this, but on studies in the future of charging this amount for this treatment, what it adds up to on the back end is actually less on the front end. So it was interesting where they were like, my patients aren't going to pay for this. And I was like, but they will. Mm-hmm. So that's already a fallacy that we have to overcome even more in those in our, in our ophthalmology counterparts. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's big. What do you think? Um, <clears throat> what do you think are some things that us optometrists can do to to help educate the ophthalmologists in 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 the arena of the value of doing myopia management? Many of them, if they're you know in a surgical system, are are not going to do it themselves, but either referring it out or seeing the value. What are some things, some takeaways that we can do? Uh, to educate them and how to go about that. Yeah. So, and whenever I see a myopic patient, I obviously send, or I send a patient or a letter back to the pediatrician. I always send one back to the school teacher as well, because Mm -hmm. they now know that they're going to be doing multiple visits. Uh, I also send one back if they come from a specialist. And then also you got to find who you're referring to. That's going to be your local network. I've got a LASIK surgeon now that refers to me for ortho K, right? Who would have found like ortho K? And then you've got, you know, the people that you commonly refer to for cataract surgery. Go in, ask them for 15 minutes of their time and give a little spiel and presentation. But where this is really going to come from is your practice, right? You can only do so much outreach where you're going to build your practices from your practice inside. And as people yeah. start to learn about you, it starts to spread. So it's just you becoming that expert. And I think everybody can be an expert in myopia. Yeah, agreed. 
Well, awesome. Thank you for hanging out with me and uh, sharing information about comparisons and differences and ODs and OMDs approaches to myopia management. It's always awesome to talk with you. My pleasure. And thank you for joining us for this episode of the Myopia Podcast. Make sure to like and subscribe. And we'll see you again next time. This podcast was brought to you by Optometric Insights Media. If you enjoy our content, please leave a five-star review. And don't forget to subscribe for more great episodes.